So I told uh, Dr. Hansen this morning, this is a little bit like George Jones. You know, when he played, he always wanted to sing first and then Johnny Cash second, and then they let the newbie or the rookie go third. So I apologize. This is going to be a remake of one of their shows. So um, by no means, I want to preface this as um, these are just a few of the ideas that I think about. Um, even though I studied as a swine nutritionist, um, I uh, get the pleasure of working with the marketing team and overseeing them. And so I'm certainly learning uh, a lot of the things that, that Jeff and other people who have been in the production system and looked at some of these things for many years, uh, a lot of these things may seem second nature, but I think that it's important uh, that we reiterate the important things and we walk through these um, because sometimes it is always about stressing some of the basics. And so certainly Josh led us with a lot of uh, information that we can certainly use to help make some decisions. Uh, but then in the end, uh, kind of like Brum says, I still have to put 160 pigs on a truck and I still have to move them down the road. So just for uh, to set things up, just an introduction to the NFP system. Some of you may or may not know who New Fashion Pork is. Uh, some pig flow considerations um, as pig flow and marketing really go hand in hand. Uh, your pig flow is driven off of what your marketing is. What is your target? Uh, market pig selection and personnel training. I see Brian Cohen's in here from Alanco, and I'm going to give him uh, some kudos for some things that Brian and the Alanco team and Keith Hayden uh, really helped uh, work to help me see and understand. And I think that that's a big portion uh, of my talk this morning is really focusing on, on the people, which pigs we're selecting, how to help them select the best pigs or the right pigs to pull out. Um, and then I have a slide of marketing without paling. Uh, most of you probably know that Triumph uh, in, in late December elected to go rat copamine free. And so that certainly changed the dynamics of our marketing. And I will preface that and tell you that uh, we learned a lot from that and we're going to be a lot better uh, further down the road. And then uh, follow up with any questions uh, that you possibly would have. So just to uh, familiarize you with who New Fashion Pork is, our home office is here uh, in Minnesota in the southwest corner. We have about 60,000 sows from Wyoming to Indiana. Uh, so our sow bases is on, very on the outskirts of the, of the Corn Belt. But then we bring all of the finishing pigs, uh, wean pigs, if you will, and finish them out without a, within about a 100-mile radius of Esterville, Iowa. That's where our biggest feed mill would be. Uh, we market about 1.3 million pigs a year. 50% of those would be integrated, and 50% of those would be non-integrated to open packers such as Hormel. Uh, again, we're an owner member of Triumph Foods, and we have limited flex in our space. Um, historically, we have not set up turn-by-turn uh, -turn contracts. As I tell you, we're starting to do that now. Um, but traditionally, we had not really been in the ballpark of flexing space in and out. Um, space utilization is a number that's easily calculatable if you ask certain people, but it's a measure that we that some production systems really look at and really emphasize. Um, and whether that's either right or wrong, uh, I think we've had a lot of discussions with Mike. It really should probably be the opportunity loss per pig space or some sort of metric of revenue and not necessarily just a number that you look at to say, hey, my barns are full or hey, I have some barns uh, empty. We operate mostly wean, wean to finish sites, and again, we market both on a fixed weight and a fixed time. So I'll talk about that more, but because of Triumph and their wide grid that values heavy, uh, heavy pigs, that's really on a fixed time basis. Uh, conceivably, those pigs get pitched, pushed out uh, by the new finishing pigs that are going to be placed in there, and then on a fixed weight basis, really looking at Hormel and how that grid works. So the industry approach to profitability. This is a slide that I think that's really important because the swine industry does an excellent job of managing cost. We're great at this, um, I believe. Feed cost, these are just kind of some relative percentages to where costs would be today. Feed cost is about 60%. Wean cost is in about 25% of that. Facility costs, 9 to 10%. I think what's driving a lot of this is whether you own a lot of your own facilities or whether they're contract whether you own more wean to finish barns, you own more finishers, or whether you own nursery. Animal health for us is about 4%. I think that this is uh, an extremely variable cost depending upon the health of your system, how you manage that, how you manage pig flow and biosecurity, and then trucking genetics. But the one single event that we hope, and today that's questionable, pays for all of this is marketing. So in our system, we have 400 and some people that work every day to feed the pigs, minimize cost but we have only a handful of people that really look at revenue. And so we really, I believe, have to take a different approach to this and really uh, think about that revenue stream uh, just a little more. 
So again, talking about marketing, pig flow uh, is a big driving factor of this. And so the number of spaces that you're going to have are going to be dependent upon one, what type of system do you have? Do you have a wean to finish system? Or are you operating traditional nurseries? We have a couple of flows that are on traditional nurseries and then about 80% of the other flows are all on wean to finish. They have different numbers of spaces. It's not the same number. And then the second, you could maybe even put this as number one, is your intended market weight. If you're going to market at 260, you're going to need a lot less space than if you're going to market at 305. And then the sow farm output. I think the sow farm, uh, and Wayne says this a lot, uh, you got to make sure that the tail doesn't wag the dog. Um, and I think that's important. You have to think about the sow farm uh, output in that way. How can you keep the sow farm running at optimum for your marketing, or how do you keep marketing optimum even when the sow farm is over or underproducing? And then mortality. Obviously, if your pigs are dying, you don't need as much space. Uh, growth performance, which is seasonality, and then biosecurity. So I work with Dr. Deb Murray, who uh, won the, the Practitioner Award uh, here this morning. Um, biosecurity is certainly a huge focus of ours, and that comes into pig flow. How many down days are you able to take, and can you afford to take, um, and what's that improvement in mortality? Those things are all very important. So at defining space, and I'm going to kind of go through this slide very quickly, um, but I think it's because we've kind of uh, beat a dead horse on this one a little bit this morning, but each producer does define that a little bit differently. So to Josh, a square foot on a finishing pig or a space may be 7.2. To Brad Frecking, that may be 6.8. So defining and really understanding what that square footage is that you are going to base your system around uh, is really going to define some things. And so I just kind of put up some general uh, literature, really, averages, and, and they can be extrapolated certainly to industry uh, based on a lot of Dr. Brum's words. Um, for the traditional nursery barn, somewhere around 2.7 to 3 point square feet. And again, um, depends on how you measure that. And we've certainly looked at and highlighted some of this for quite a while. Uh, Dr. Hines back in 83 looked at this. On the feeder to finish barn, somewhere between 6.8 and 7.2. And again, uh, Dr. Ganyu, and then again, uh, more recently, Josh has really looked at that to open our eyes, and maybe we should think about that number a little bit differently. And then on a wean to finish site is really half of what you want your finishing space to be. So it uh, depends on what you're targeting for your finishing space. And uh, Dr. Walter certainly did, uh, and Dr. Brown probably did the majority of the bulk of that research looking at how do you treat pigs in wean to finish flows. At what age do you split them out? At what weight do you split them out? Um, how do you really relieve that pressure? So you need to divide this total usable barn space by the denominator of your desired weight. I don't know how many of you in this room are responsible for setting up contracts, but for a contract grower, you can set those numbers a lot different uh, depending on who you talk to. Is that usable barn space? Is that including the feeder? Is that including the alleyway? I would tell you in June and July, if I could get a feeder and a water in the alleyway and I knew that we could humanely and efficiently raise pigs there, that's pig space. Uh, if we can put them in the office, I would probably be voting to get more space. Uh, and certainly Josh has highlighted that I probably need to be thinking about that more and more. So for some of you that uh, are thinking about your space and how you calculate it, I just wanted to walk through just a, uh, a, a, an easy uh, demonstration of how we really look at space. And so for our system, 6,000 head sow farm is the model that we work off of. And so just using 3,300 weaned pigs uh, weaned per week at 13 pounds. And I apologize if some of this may be small, and I'll try to walk through it slowly to make sure you ask me questions at the end if we have to. As we characterize the performance of this flow, we're going to set mortality about 3.5% in the nursery with an average daily gain of 0.8, and we're going to hold them on a seven-week nursery turn. So we're going to get them to 50 pounds. As we look at the finishing performance, let's set mortality at 2.5%, look at average daily gain of a 1.85, and let's target that weight about 290. So that's in between really our Hormel and, and our Triumph weight. As we look at nursery spaces, this seems pretty straightforward. 3,300 pigs times seven weeks is 23,100 spaces. Or I need 23 nursery rooms or barns, however you want to talk about that. Or if you have a 3,300 head nursery, then you need seven weeks, uh, seven barns. I will tell you there's not a lot of 3,300 nurseries. It's probably going to be a 4,000 or an 8,000. And so you really need to think about that. But you also, in the back of your mind, think about depopping. And how is that going to work? Do you want to be able to depop and move those pigs? Um, and how do you want to think about that? 
On the finishing spaces, this is where mortality comes into play. We don't necessarily look at the nursery mortality to uh, drive nursery uh, spaces because um, as I'm gonna talk about here in a minute, we have a lot of good information from these equations, but I'll tell you one thing that's so hard to predict is mortality. Maybe the management got different. Maybe one of your workers brought the flu in. Um, all those things I can't readily predict, so I'm gonna manage that to the best of my ability and say I'm probably gonna need a few more spaces than I really need. So looking at the finishing side, using the nursery mortality, I'm gonna place almost 3,200 pigs per week. If I look and I determine that they're gonna come out of the nursery at 50 pounds, and I'm gonna to go to 290, that's gonna be 240 pounds of live weight gain. Take 240 divided by our overall average daily gain, and I'm gonna need 130 days or 19 weeks of space, and if I divide that out by a 1050, I need about 57 barns. If we keep the same information, though, and we look at a wean to finish, we're still gonna need 2,300 uh, 23, nursery spaces. But the thing that you have to remember is that on a wean to finish, you also need finishing space in those barns, right? So for the nursery, we're 50% double stock, so I only need half the nursery space, but again, you have to add in this 19 weeks of finishing. So on the wean to finish side, I'm gonna need 43 wean to finish barns. If I look at half of those pigs that are double stocked coming over on the finishing side, that's 1,600 spaces per week, and using the same information or the performance parameters that we set uh, in the previous slide, we're gonna need about 29 finishing barns. So you can tell that the spaces are a lot different depending on what your system uh, is characterized by. So as we look at fixed time versus fixed weight, I view fixed time as the inability to have slack in your finishing space during the summer. Your barn utilization number is gonna be really high in the summer, but it's gonna be right, if you will, in the winter. So it's gonna look the best, you're gonna have the best performance. The fixed weight side of things, though, is your ability to achieve a single targeted weight. So if you're targeting two packers, though, you're gonna be both fixed time and fixed weight, potentially. So in our system, we have that. So how do we approach that? Um, and these are just a couple of options, and again, not saying that this is the only way, but this is a way, is we split sex pigs upon departing the sow farm. So we gender separate those and we place them in the barn and such. So whether that's barrows in the back and gilts in the front or barrows on one side and gilts in the others, we just have to have some sort of way to identify those uh, in the barn. And then all pigs are placed, uh, again, in a wean to finish barn. At the end of that nursery phase though, we move the barrows over onto the feeder side. We keep the gilts on the wean to finish side um, because the gilts we're gonna target to a packer that honors a lean premium and we're gonna take those to a lot lighter market weight than we are the barrows. So if we think about our space, uh, we have cheaper space on a feeder to finish site than we do on a wean to finish. Other options could be flexing space in and out of your system. So I don't know how many of you take Daryl Kunkel's live wire, and daily I bet you could count 10 to 15 emails of people looking for space. And I think ractopamine going out of a lot of these large integrators is driving a lot of that. And so I tell you, if you don't have space today, you're probably not gonna have it next summer either. You really have to start kind of lining these things out. And again, thinking about the sow farm, selling pigs. Help keep your wean pig costs low at the sow farm, and then you can inherently increase the space out in your grow finish to make sure that you're meeting that packer's demand. So what do we feel like the advantages are of leaving those gilts on the wean side and the barrels on the other side? We need less space on the wean to finish. We can market on a fixed weight to a packer that uh, values a lean premium, uh, and it's again the most uh, expensive space in a flow, and again we all know that it's the slower growing of the sexes. By leaving the barrows on the feeder side, which do require more space, uh, we're marking on a fixed time, uh, we have a wide grid that values high quality large pigs, um, and the input cost for feeder space is somewhat less than a wean to, uh, wean to finish barn. And again, the reason why it's fixed time is because groups are pushed out by the need for space by new feeder groups, and opportunity loss from increased fixed costs. So a lot of people would say that you get less than 50% of the pigs in the barn, your opportunity loss is diminishing, you need to get them all on out the barn. So kind of switching gears as we look at uh, the numerous, uh, looking at market pig selection, I think it's important to talk about how do you calculate the weight of your first cuts. I would say if we took a poll, everyone probably does it somewhat differently. Um, but I've just kind of highlighted three. Uh, the first one will be feed intake, and I would say that that's probably the most preferred by some um, because it's health and seasonal dependent. If pigs are sick, they don't eat. If they're hot, they don't eat. 
but you can also use a growth curve. Okay, you can maintain that information, update that readily, stay on top of that, and you can kind of characterize those curves. I would tell you, don't do it on your system. You need to find some sort of smaller metric to measure that by, whether it's south source or geographical, because if you do it just for your system, um, you're really going to be uh, shooting yourself in the foot because that's not, you can do better than that, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And then again, you can look at some historical performance. You can look at cyclical changes. You can know how that grower does. Um, you can try to keep up on that. I would say that that one's maybe a little bit more labor intensive. But even with Josh's information, and I wanna make sure that, um, that, that I don't step on any toes here, because I, I use Josh's information. I will tell you that um, I wanted to share some information, but we haven't been utilizing it in the system long enough that I felt that there'd probably be a lot of confidence uh, in the audience to be able to, to do that. So maybe we'll come back and report back in. But even with Josh's information, I still feel like there's a high value in looking at the pig. And to do that, you need repeatable and dependable marketers that are trained to a level of precision and accuracy. So I'm gonna show some slides and some information that Brian really helped with, and I have a great team of marketers uh, that are really good at guessing weight and can really help me drive revenue by getting the right pigs out of the barn. But the reason why they're so important is there's these barn level inputs that are gonna drive, and Josh hit on this, are gonna change a lot of things. So inputs, the environment, and disease outbreaks that are gonna increase this. So I'm gonna show you a slide here, uh, and this allows us to not repeatably predict that. So we, I don't know if some of you saw the, uh, Dr. Murray's presented and sent out some memos about we had a Delta Corona outbreak right after the first of the year. And so I thought, that's interesting. I bet I can probably characterize that. And we had one flow that got hit extremely hard. We blew 18 barns in a matter of three days. So as I characterize those two flows, if I look at the standard deviation, I had a 33% increase in standard deviation in, in marketing weight between flow A that had essentially every site blown with Delta Corona compared to flow B that didn't. You can see that the standard deviation stayed the same. And if we normalize that around the mean and look at a different measure of variation and look at CV, we had a 15% increase in CV between flow A and flow B. And so looking at some of Josh's measure makes me feel good that my CV is around seven because that's kind of what he showed a little bit too. Um, but this is something that equations aren't going to predict. But I will tell you that my marketers struggled to get pigs out of the barn that weren't going to be pre-markets. So as I just try to kind of look at this uh, from an average daily gain standpoint, and the closeouts, I only picked out a 4% average daily gain difference. But a lot of that's gonna be driven by, uh, there's some variability in average daily gain across sites, um, but I will tell you that this is probably the worst case scenario. If you look at just some individual barns, it's probably double or triple that. So as we look at, well, what does that mean from a dollar standpoint? Well, I just calculated revenue on a 310 pound uh, live weight selling at a CV of 7%, the revenue is $161.68 per head, okay? So I'm not looking at sort loss, I'm not looking at pre-markets, I'm just looking at just kind of the basics here. And I don't know if you can see this, but this is just a normal distribution. If I increase that CV only 1%, my value per head goes down $2.78. If I look at it with the reduction, 4% reduction in average daily gain and still having a 1% increase in CV, it's a $3.77 uh, change. I'll tell you on some barns, we probably lost almost seven, eight, maybe even nine bucks a head, and it's because of the pre-markets. And so I highlighted what happens is we're struggling to get enough of those pigs over 220 pounds to get them into a normal packer. I've got to sell them to a light market at a discount. As we think about managing space with disease in mind, I want to make sure with all the veterinarians that we gave, the, gave them a little bit of loving. You need to understand what percentage of utilization you are okay with. What's that number you're okay with? Um, that's a number in our system that uh, whether you agree with it or not, um, there's people in our system that find a lot of value in that. And depopping sites will impact that. And we've calculated that cost for us to be 50 cents per head. Essentially, that's the average of down days that you're going to take um, on those end of, end of the, or the dump pigs that come out. Um, how many more extra days do you need to make sure that that site is completely empty? You can power wash it, disinfect it, and get it dried, which is an important point. And so as we look at the utilization numbers with and without a depop to Packer A, it's about 2.5%. 
And even on Packer B, where we have more marketing strategies, that Depop is going to be about 2.5% of your utilization. So that's a number that you need to know so you don't beat up on your marketing guys when your utilization goes down. Well, hey, I'm, I'm Depopping these sites. Kind of switching gears and thinking again about training the marketers, I think it's important to invest in training and retaining quality people. And I, I, I want to talk about Alanco's uh, mass training, their marketable animal selection training. Um, and Brian Cones and, and Keith Hayden and Nick Pudence and those guys uh, came in and helped us really develop a, a program that will help train our marketers, training the people that are going to be selecting these pigs. And just in short, what they did was we set up pins of market animals and simulated trainings. Okay, We put 25 pigs in a pin and they simply had to pick the five heaviest pigs. Seems simple, right? You'd be wrong. Um, depending on the barn setup, depending on where they're at in the barn, uh, depending on the genetics, what the pigs look like, the health status, as you increase variability, those pigs are hard to find. So after each class, though, we work through the session to determine why incorrect pigs were selected. The tallest is not always the heaviest pigs. So one of the things they talked about on a 280-pound pig, one inch of width is almost 22 pounds. Well, if I make an inch taller pig, I'm not sure what the hawk is going to weigh, but I can guarantee you it's probably not 22 pounds. And it's probably not adding value to the belly, which is important to me. And then it's okay to incorporate certain aspects of livestock judging. I don't think we talk about stockmanship enough or some of those things, but really when we get into the pen, uh, one of my best marketers, Joe Brockmuller, the best view that he likes is a three-quarter view. He wants to see how wide the chest is on that barrel, how big a ham that he has, and he's thinking about all the cuts that they're going to be making, and that's important. And I put a picture of symbol three. And I had someone in the office ask me what this is. And I, some of you may know what symbol three is, but we haven't seen about it or talked about it a lot. But it's the ideal market pig. And I think this is probably back in the early 2000s when the National Pork Board put this out. But I just want to stress the point to communicate what that ideal market pig looks like. So part of the mass training was I have the marketer here. And we can actually look at the pounds of opportunity that's left. So if I picked out of the pen, if I only got four of the five heaviest pigs out, how many pounds of opportunity did I leave in the pen because I missed a pig? And so as we look at through, uh, through this, uh, this procedure, you know, some of, these pit, some of these guys are twice as much as some of the others, meaning uh, we had one marketer that only left 114 pounds of opportunity left. And then I have, I think that's me up there at the top at 303. So uh, obviously you can see that there are some varying abilities in your marketers to be able to pick out those, uh, those pigs. And since then, we've added some other types of training, essentially as pre-markets. We go into a barn, and is this pig 220 or is it not? That's important because if I send a 221-pound pig to a pre-market or light market, I'm leaving dollars on the table. But if I also send a 215-pound pig into the packer that gets a discount of 65%, I'm really kind of taking it in the shorts there as well. So training the marketers, focusing on barn economics. Uh, most are working to maximize the load. And so one of the things that was communicated to me early in my job was that really what you think is going on in the field, you should go out and validate it. And so one of the first things that I realized was that the marketers, unbeknownst to them, were trying to maximize the load economics. So one of the major shifts in our thinking was you really need to understand the entire barn economics. I care less about the revenue on the first cuts as I do the 50% of the pigs that I'm going to market at the dump. And I think that that's important that they understand that because sometimes you have to shoot a few hostages. And I'm okay with shooting a load. And maybe in some opportunities, maybe you need to shoot two loads. Provide marketing reports for benchmarking. Our marketing guys get a benchmark on each load, and they include the major economical drivers as hot carcass weight, percent grid, heavies, lights. Give them the information that they need to be successful, and then we need to incentivize them for the right decisions. This is a moving target. So we kind of saw the mushroom cloud in May, what was going to happen now, and so we started pulling ahead. Well, I had to call the marketers and say, hey, anything over this weight needs to be sold. You have to have people that can readily and adaptably change to that very quickly because then six weeks later I call them back, let's put the weight back on, and they have to completely change their thinking. So having, having people that can do that uh, is, is very important. So one way that we do that is we have a monthly marketing meeting and we review kind of some case studies. So we look at some problem barns that I can find in the closeouts and we say, okay, what happened? So this is cut one. And most producers or all should receive some sort of individual carcass information from their lots. Use it. 
I think it's information that you that gets in your inbox and you scroll through it and make sure that you didn't have a sort loss of 20 bucks and really screw the pooch. Um, use that information. This was cut one on a barn and you can see that we had two pigs over here that were 160 pounds. Why did those pigs leave? Was it because the grower didn't get them out? Did we market them wrong? You know, what's the reason why those pigs left? Kind of invertly on the other side though is, as we look at cut three, why did we have some pigs that were over 260 pounds live weight? As I think about the discount for those heavies, that begins to become pigs that should have been in cut two. So what happened? Was it the barn design that didn't allow us to make better decisions? Um, what were the reasons why that we had those? And we try to talk through those um, as, as much as we can. Again, on communicating what is acceptable, as we think about that, and I'm trying to dump the barn a little over 300, if I need to have some of those heavies to make sure that I'm pushing that average market weight all the way kind of towards the top of the tier, I, it's okay to have some heavies. So I kind of looked at an example of 500 pigs left in the barn where I'm trying to hit a barn dump of 310 with a CV of 7%. It looks like I'm maximizing dollars per head revenue when I have four heavies. Oops, what? there we go, at four heavies. The marketers need to know that those four heavies are okay, but I also need to understand are those four heavies because the marketers did their job right or was it because the growers didn't get the right pigs out of the barn? So as we think about a marketing audit, and I don't know if some of you in the back can see this picture, but how many of you have been in the barn where there's no pigs in the front and everything's in the back? Probably all of us. So as we think about how those pigs grow, I hear it from the marketers all the time as I tell them that they have to pick equal numbers of pigs at every pen. Well, they grow faster in the front. Yep, but I'm gonna shoot some hostages and get some floor space that's gonna provide me more value than just leaving everything crammed in the back. So when I went to the back of this barn, I had one pig in one pen, two in another, and then I had about 15 in that one. Is that a good use of space? Probably not. So as you think about that, how are you gonna hold these people accountable? And you have to hold everybody accountable. You can't just hold the contract grower or the employee that's in the barns. You have to hold the marketing staff too. So for the marketer, we have a marketing service report that gives some information about when the barn's gonna dump and I force them to have some sort of previewing strategy. Previewing the barn is important. You can gauge it from the paper, but until you look at the pigs, you don't really have a good idea. And we leave a preview and a proposed marketing strategy. But from a contract and employee grower side, validation of the correct marking of pigs. So what the auditor has to do is go in and validate that the marketer actually marked the right number of pigs, leave, let the load crew load them, and then come back afterwards and make sure that the space was opened up for the pigs, what's the percent of marked pigs that they took, uh, and really try to work with them. Determine the percentage of correct pigs loaded, was the unused space opened back up to the remaining inventory? I would say that the sick pen is probably, or the pull pen is the worst place this happens. They don't want to pull any sick pens. Oh, they're not big enough. Well, you've got 23 pigs in there and they have no space. Get some of them out, or if you have another open area of the barn, let them have that. Those are those potentially, and most of them end up in the pull pen, end up being full value pigs. No, they're not 310 pounds, but I can still sell them over 220. And then complete after pre-sorting, but before loading, and then we have to finalize the load after the loading crew has left for the evening. These are not fun audits to do. Um, and then do we incentivize them or do we charge them? If they gave me too many heavies, do I charge them the sort loss or do we try to incentivize good behavior? And then the last slide that I'm gonna end on is marketing without paling. And again, looking at Daryl Kunkel's Livewire, um, I can tell you that we probably didn't plan for space enough without paling. We didn't really understand uh, really what this was all going to entail to be, to be able to successfully implement it. But I will tell you that it's probably hard to find a feed additive that's going to replace paling. But you can find a management technique that'll get fairly close, and that is space. And so as you look at market weights, just kind of on average, uh, it's you know about a 10 pound reduction without paling if you have the same number of spaces. So I think as we get, get more down this pathway, uh, it's important that you spend that money that you were uh, investing in ractopamine we need to be investing that in space. I think that that's important. This graph really demonstrates that.